Situated in the heart of vibrant Bermondsey is the Glassburn Studio, which was established by Peter Layton in 1976. The gallery hosts an exciting display of contemporary work created by Peter and his team, with a particular flair for the use of colour, form and texture. Peter was brought up in Bradford, where his aptitude as an artist was first recognised. After school, he found himself working in the textile business, and after a spell in the National Service, he pursued his love of art and specialised in ceramics. It was during this period that he was introduced to glass. Today, I'm here to talk to Peter Layton at his workshop. Are you described as a glass blower? I'm never quite sure of this, you know. I'm yes, glass blower, um, glass maker. Glass maker. Yes. Um, I mean, you've lifted the studio glass really into a, 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 an individual art form over the years. And uh, so what I really want to talk about today is, is your career, how you've got there, and perhaps how you see the future of glass. I, I have contributed, there's yeah. no question, but, but so have so many others. And the person that really started the whole studio glass movement in this country is a guy called Sam Herman, uh, and he was a student of Harvey Littleton, who's the father figure of the whole international studio glass movement. I mean, historically, glass was uh, a secret occupation passed from father to son and carried on behind closed doors. And people like me, or artists in general, uh, craftsmen in general, unless they had that history, that tradition, couldn't gain access. And it's even been that way until fairly recently, say, on the island of Murano. And of course, that becomes very incestuous. Um, in the Middle Ages, the Muranese, the Venetians, uh, had death squads whom they sent out to track down any errant glassmaker who was off to try and sell up, sell the secrets of the trade. Studio glass movement, as, as such, is really only 50, just over 50 years old. As I said, Harvey Littleton, trained as a potter, but had some experience of glass because his father was the research chemist at Corning. But he had the thought that glass be worked in the same way. Why does it have to be in a factory with teams of people? And he, he suggested that at Corning and they laughed at him. You know, the industry certainly laughed. And he managed to persuade, get a Fulbright scholarship or get funding somehow from the American Crafts Council, I think it was, to do a trip to Europe and check out how, what was happening there. And he, um, he went to Murano, uh, where he saw people working out of small furnaces, but he was promptly marched out of the factory. You know, as I said, rather yeah. paranoid approach. Uh, that. That happened in a couple of places. I think Vanini were much more progressive and much more uh, tolerant and, and encouraged his ideas. And uh, at some point on that trip, he uh, he was in Germany, in the south, in almost on the Czech border, in um, in the Bavarian forest area, where there's a glassmaking community based around Sweezel and a village of Fraunau, which was a, a completely glassmaking community. And there he found some work by a chap called Erwin Eich, whose father owned a factory and allowed him, he'd had a training in fine art and allowed his son to put, put a small furnace together and uh, play around in the basement. And Littleton saw his work and was immediately struck and thought, this is exactly, you know, the kind of thing I'm interested in. You know, somebody making art out of glass, which was, in a sense, I mean, the, the art of glass is thousands of years old, but it, but it tends to have been rather, how can I put it, utilitarian in a way. Uh, you know, the, the, the emphasis always been on functional art. And uh, here was somebody who was making objects in glass. But he started a global movement. And Studio Glass now exists in virtually, well, in virtually every country in the world. The London Glass Blowing Studios is a working studio where Peter and his teams work on various commissions and one-off pieces. 
Visitors to the gallery are able to watch the process of blowing and moulding the glass, which grows organically whilst trying to achieve a form of controlled symmetry. Whilst some glassmakers create technically brilliant pieces, others prefer to create more ambidextrous works of art. So I asked Peter about the influence of Scandinavian glass with their contemporary and pioneering work. Well, there are certainly one, there are certainly very important artists working in Scandinavia. Finn Lingard was a great pioneer. Um, Bertel Wallin, who's developed the whole sand casting method of produ producing glass objects. Uh, his wife, Ulrika Heidemann Wallin, very important people. Um, Ulla Fuschel, the, 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 you know, the list, Anne Wolf, the, the, the list is endless. However, Scandinavia as such, is, again, really has a, a, a factory tradition. Yeah, yeah. And the sad thing, I mean, I'm glad you, you mentioned them, because the sad thing is that these factories are closing mm, mm. down all over the world. And fairly recently, Orifors, famous name in glassmaking, closed its doors for the last time and all those skills, those skills are lost. But in future, glass blowing, for instance, which is very cost intensive, mm. materials, fuel, labor, if, you, if you're employing people, in my case, huge rent in the middle of London. We use pretty medieval tools, by the way, and we use something called jacks or pucellas to thin down and pull out a neck. The, the main centers for Studio Glass have been United States because what happened was that Littleton went back, having met, had this experience of meeting people, set up the first glass blowing course in the, at the University of Wisconsin in the early 60s and his students have spread all over the place, uh, certainly all over the states. Uh, Dale Chihuly, who's the most charismatic uh, figure in, in world, in global studio glass, uh, has been m very instrumental, and, and others of his students, Marvin Lepofsky, and Sam Herman, who I mentioned, came to, to, came to Britain, uh, originally on a Fulbright to Edinburgh, and then went to the Royal College and set up a course there, or influenced the glass making. Because prior to that, at the Royal College, it had been working on a drawing board, coming up with a design, taking it to a technician and hoping mm. that they would somehow translate that and designing for industry. But as I said, the industry in the meantime has died. So, you know, where, where are we all left? And, and the studios, thank God, have taken over. Now, um, the trend, if you like, in, in Studio Glass today is very much to less expensive, oh, less cost-intensive mm. techniques than blowing. So kiln-forming techniques, slumping, bending, uh, fusing, casting, those are the kind of direction a lot of people are going because those sort of things that one can do in one's garage in the front room or you know in the kitchen even. There's still plenty of people blowing once it gets you is amazing and my own experience bears that out. I burnt myself really badly, I mean seriously badly, to roll molten glass over the back of my hand. All I knew about it was this wonderful smell of cooking pork or something, you know, it smelled like, you know, um, so my, my flesh was burned off the back of my hand and I, event and I, I you know, I was so new to it that I was just fixated on finishing my wonderful piece and suddenly I came to my senses, my God, you know, threw it in the bin and ran for help, found some amazing spray somewhere in the students' union and touch wood, you know, it's, it, it all healed back. But um, and I thought that was the end of my career as a glassmaker, very much so. But, um, but once, you, once you have a go, you get hooked. Yeah. And um, eventually I found a uh, an old towage works on the Thames yep. uh, down in Rotherhithe and, and started my own studio. With the glass, although you're, you're working horizontally, rolling the glass across the arms of a chair, 
you've still got to keep it on centre and you let gravity do the work in this case. You, keep, you have to keep turning, otherwise the glass simply drips off onto the floor. And again, I, I, I quite enjoy, how can I put it, the more accidental yeah. effects that one can achieve. And, uh, and, I, and the people I work with know that if, if there's a kind of an accident or an error, that'll be the one I love and, you know, that, they'll ask, that I'll ask them to try and help me to reproduce. Glass had always been a team activity yeah. In, yeah. in factories, as I said, behind closed doors. And, and of course, we do work on our own yeah. sometimes. But there are so many more things one can do with help. If we're working on a piece that's extraordinarily big and extraordinarily complex, we may have a team of several people. Again, in the factories, they tended to have huge equipment with many portholes where you could gather the coloured glass and many of the pots. The glass was melted in huge pots, you know, maybe each one contained a ton of glass and you'd have a clear one or several clear ones and you might have some coloured ones. But then of course you're restricted to what you can do with those particular colours. Uh, of course it's not really a restriction, you can do endless things. Uh, luckily there are people around who produce colour and we use it in various forms, in powders, in solid rods, in granules. We invent or reinvent myriad techniques to get the colour into the glass because our speciality is colour. Depending on what effect we want will dictate what, a, what technique we use. What we're going to do today is make a, a simple cylinder onto which we're going to apply pre-made marbles or, or spheres of colour. And it'll take us a little while to do that. We've only just put these skylights in and we're delighted with the effect. So what Bruce has done is he's picked up some preheated lump of colour. And this is a mixture that we use for a series we call Reef, which was based on a trip I made to the Barrier Reef, and it's a sort of underwatery look. So you can get them in granulated form. These are granules of colour. We made that mixture from a, a, range, a variety of colours of the same size. The glass blower uses a steel tube or blowpipe to gather glass from the furnace. Glass shaping begins with the rolling of the hot glass on a steel table or marva. The pipe is then blown causing the trapped air to expand and this will create the bubble. Each time the glass blower gathers glass from the furnace it will dictate the size of the finished piece. About there. Maybe, maybe, maybe just a touch lower. I mean, you've got lots of influences. I mean, not just the artistic, because I, I, there's some that are based on Hockney paintings, the Gauguin, the latest I've seen of, uh, on the Van Gogh. But you're also influenced, aren't you, by the environment? Yes, uh, I, I suppose, you know, the, uh, how can I put it, the earlier pieces, the earlier work was all very much based on natural forms. Mm. I'm a, I'm a beachcomber from way back, so, and still am. Uh, and you know, the, I don't, I don't go near a beach, and I'm not, you know, looking for treasure. We have a, a series called Spirale, which is basically based on shell forms, mm. spiraling the glass. I used to make a lot of shell forms, and I iridized in those days. That's a fairly dangerous process you're emitting fumes yeah. that aren't good for you. So we don't do that anymore. And I, th I think most people have given that. There are people who are still doing it in a, in a small way, but it's not a pleasant technique. So, but it, it, it is very beautiful. It's the kind of effects that oil and water, or that Tiffany, Tiffany glass displays. And, um, and what's more, you get a wonderful surface that doesn't finger mark. So for years and years and years, perhaps it's my potting background, I, I was more, I was very interested in tactile qualities of the glass as much as the visual. 
and uh, when I stopped iridizing, I, I started etching the glass with a mild acid, not pure hydrofluoric, which is again totally lethal stuff. But a, a version which is called sugar acid, which just takes the surface off. Or you can use a sandblaster, of course. So again, the work was very tactile. So natural forms were the basis of what I did, and still are to a large extent. So take me through the process of, of making one of your pieces. Right, so the concept is, is often quite loose. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to see what comes out, and I'll, I'll establish a direction. And as I said earlier, you know, there may be some accident, or I'm working with one of my team, one of my crew, and they've misheard me or misinterpreted what I said. So they've, they've maybe used a different color way, and I will respond, you know, if, if I think that's better than what I actually thought of in the mm. first place. I'm, I'm very keen for their input. I think it makes it much more interesting for them too. I'm getting on a bit. It's not that I can't actually get in there and handle the glass. Some glass makers live to a, a ripe old age and, and that's great. Uh, and they continue doing what they do. And, and of course there are different philosophies. There are some glass makers who want to repeat as perfectly as they can uh, time after time the object they're making, you know, like a beautiful goblet. And, uh, I, I like to think, maybe mistakenly, that we have a somewhat more creative approach because I don't want them to look alike. I want, them, I want each piece to look different. We tend to work in series because it takes a long time to develop an idea. You know, it would be great. I'd love to do totally one-off pieces, you know, which so for hundreds of thousands of pounds, which, which is the case with some of the American glassmakers. We are in a wonderful street. It's like being in New York. It's got that kind of vibe. Wonderful bars, wonderful restaurants, other galleries, White Cube, the Fashion and Textile Museum, and us. And we love being here until the Shard has arrived. You know, our clientele may change. Yeah, but mean, at the moment, we don't have, you know, the multi-millionaires or billionaires coming in. Not, not every day of the week anyway, occasionally. You know, we have had the odd Ferrari pull up and somebody come in and say, I'll have that, that, that and that. And that's great when it happens, but it's not, it doesn't happen very often. I, lo I love having a team. I love having this interaction, which we do have. And, and even my instructions tend to be a little vague and ambiguous in the hope that something will, will emerge, you know, that I didn't expect, because that's really exciting. I went to Petra some years ago. It's a, it's a city, uh, a Nabataean city in Jordan, carved out of solid rock, sedimentary rock, and it's all wonderful reds and blacks, the sand and different variations in color. And I came back and searched for, you know, months, you know, to try and achieve that quality. Well, it, it ended up being a series called Mirage, and. And from that Nabataean black and red, it turned into a much more of a sort of desert, duny. Customers tell me it looks like Namibia or it looks like somewhere in the middle of France or Ayers Rock, you know, in Australia. So, you know, these things evolve and change and one gets pleasure from seeing that happen. Glass is a hugely versatile material. I always used to say that about clay too. I mean, you can make clay look like anything. But the problem with clay, for me, is that it's very long-winded. If you're a thrower, you can throw a few pots quickly. Then you've got to bisque fire them and you've got to glaze them. And eventually you have a kiln opening. With the glass, you actually have a kiln opening every day of the week. And you have to make decisions very quickly. And that's what I love about it. It's a spontaneous, immediate medium. When we're working as a group, other people will help make those decisions. That gives them a degree of responsibility in the matter. And even when new people come, they get the vibe fairly quickly. You can do all sorts of amazing things. You can pull it into threads, you can make it in sheets. So you can fuse it, slump it, form it in 
loads of ways and with blowing of course you can use moulds if you want to I mean the fact that you can etch it and make it more tactile is, is, or sandblast it or cut into it one of the guys here does very deep cuttings so he blows very thick objects and then cuts away a lot of the glass that's Jochen Ott another of my team is Anthony Scala who primarily works in an extraordinarily precise manner. He was trained as an architectural model maker. So his forms are uh, often deconstructed and reassembled, but done in such a precise manner, it's staggering. The other thing that's important to talk about is that it isn't purely about technique. You know, it's having an idea and finding a way of expressing it. Right now, we're making marbles, which we, we don't normally do, but those are go we're going to stick those onto, this is an experimental piece, um, and it may fail, but, yeah. but never, it will do it anyway, because it'll be interesting, and we're going to make a simple cylinder and then apply these, these marbles to the surface. A little bit along these lines, these, these weren't actually marbles, but a little bit like this. It's, a, it's a, a variation on that theme. And what about commissioning for the domestic market? How can we encourage more people to experiment a bit more? It, it's, um, that, is, that is a little bit tricky. We've got a gallery on the road front and the workshop is behind and from the street you can see what's going on in the background and people walk in to the gallery and their jaws often drop and they say, oh my God, I, I had no idea you could do this sort of thing with glass. How amazing. And I think we've opened a lot of people's eyes to glass. There's a whole poppy series I did. Um, and that, that took a lot of development. And the, I mean, the centers, the black centers are textured. And they're wonderful. This gentleman saw those and but he's asked me to do something with much more three-dimensional movement in it so I've been experimenting as to how I can make these platter forms but more textured I mean I think his description was like a flamenco dancer's skirt it's a bit of a tall order yeah. but so that's an interesting commission mm -hmm. and as I said to you earlier I love these things because they they challenge you and they set you off in a direction you wouldn't necessarily have gone to. So you go off on a sort of um, little, as it were, side road, red herring, to try and get these flamenco down, but it'll feed back. I'd like to just kind of bring you back to running a studio. I mean, it's a huge commitment, isn't it? Mm. I mean, are there still apprenticeships for, for glass blowers, or is that gone completely. I mean, no, no there are. I mean, you know, obviously there's a limit to how many people mm -hmm. would take on at any yeah. given time, but, um, you know, virtually virtually everybody who works here, in my glass blowing team, has kind of served a kind of apprenticeship. You know, they've come from college, or not. Bruce, he, he started from scratch, and he had done a bit of lamp work, flame work, which is working with tubes over a kind of Bunsen burner. Um, and that was his experience when he, when he turned up and said, you know, will you teach me or can, can I join you? You know, I, okay, he's now my workshop manager. And, uh, and I've always thought of it as being a bit like having a huge family. Mm. You know, and, and that's how it is here. Yeah. Uh, and what's been wonderful is how glass has transcended the political barriers. Yeah. We operate like a mini kibbutz, you know, we're, we're quite a democratic setup and I'd like, you know, it'd be nice to think that if I retire or keel over in a while, things will continue. Obviously, I'd like to be thought of as having made a major yeah. contribution. And actually, fine artists often look down on, on the decorative art people that's a great shame, particularly as more and more fine artists are using mm. craft skills, craft techniques to make their work or to have people act as technicians in their work. Um, and I'd like, I'd, like, I'd like to think that in years to come, I don't know how I'll be remembered, but I'd like 
class to be accepted as a as a, a medium. Uh, you know, I've, I always think of it as a bit like a Cinderella medium. Yeah, I'm sitting here talking to you. You enthuse about the subject. I mean, it's you just want to go out and tell the world because it's just wonderful. I can't ever see you retiring. I think you're really. <laughs> Uh, I suspect not. No, yeah. that's I mentioned we were yeah, flat hunting, yeah, but yeah. that that's in order to be closer, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I can just pop in and you know, and I can gracefully or, or withdraw in a sort of dignified fashion, you know, and hope that I can continue to make a contribution. I think glass is definitely coming. Good. If it hasn't already got here, it's on its way. You know, and I'm I'm very proud. I'm very pleased and proud to be part of that evolution. Yeah. You're welcome. We had, I think we had four on a wall at Collect, which is an amazing exhibition at the Saatchi Gallery organised by the Crafts Council that everybody ought to see because it is wonderful and it's probably the best craft show in Europe, one of the best in the world. I think I think people commission more by the name of the maybe I'm wrong here more by the name of the artist you know somebody whose work they they really like uh, than because they need a vase or uh, I might be wrong you know uh, 
I mean, we, we I think we, we've got a gallery here yeah. in, in front of our, of uh, 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 the road, on the road front, and the workshop is behind, and from the street you can see what's going on in the background, and people walk in to the gallery and their jaws often drop and they say, oh my God, I, I had no idea you could do this sort of thing with glass. How amazing. And I think we've opened a lot of people's eyes to, to, uh, to, to glass. Um, domestic commissions, we've had some, and I am actually working on one right now, and it's, and it's a wall piece, uh, and it's, it's built, it's, it's, it will be, I haven't actually made it, but I've actually started experimenting. Uh, he, he wants, um, he's going to provide uh, some swatches of his brand new furniture and his, from what I've seen so far, very rich colors, wonderful purple and gray and uh, ochre, ochre, um, or a rusty, rusty orangey yellow. And that could, you know, that'll be interesting to see how I manage to deal with that. Um, I've, I've already done a few experiments because what he's after is not just a simple platter, which is what we've done before. I mean, I've, I've sold a number of these. Uh, there's a whole poppy series I did. Um, and that, that took a lot of development and the... I mean, the centers, the black centers are, are, are textured and they're, and they're wonderful. And then I did a, a series called Tempest, which was derived from that Hockney Arrival of Spring series. And I've done quite well with those. Yeah, we, we do, I, I, I found, we had, I think we had commissions really challenging. The wall at because Collect, they push you in a direction you wouldn't necessarily all at re Saatchi Gallery go, organized you know, by the Cross Cancer. And, and, and I, I like that aspect of it because it is wonderful and it's probably the best craft show in Europe, one of the best in the world. Um, and we did well with those and uh, this particular <coughs> uh, gentleman has saw those and, but he's asked me to do something with much more three-dimensional movement in it. So I've been experimenting as to how I can make these platterforms but more more textured. I mean I think his description was like a flamenco dancer's skirt, you know. Well that is a bit of a tall order, yeah. you know, because uh, you could maybe even do these things <clears throat> on a small scale, but of course when you're working very when you begin to work large, uh, platters this sort of size, what, two feet across or three you know, more. <clears throat> It, uh, it, it increases the problems enormously. But, so that's an interesting commission. And as I said to you earlier, I love these things because they, they challenge you and they set you off in a direction you wouldn't necessarily have gone to. So you go off on a sort of um, little, as it were, side road, red herring, to try and get these flamenco down, but it'll feed back. And in fact, um, in fact part of what I... Uh, what I've come up with are, are based on these sort of strange flower forms uh, which I've applied to that particular piece. I don't know if you can see it, you know, there is movement there and I want to try and develop that. I can do it on that scale, but, but you know, to do it large is, is much harder. Um, and that was part of this, you know, this, that was part of this commission. Oh, in fact, over there, we're, I'll get, if I may, I'll get the last ones because some of these were really, these were really uh, lovely. You know, I, I'm, I've still yet to, and these actually developed out of um, when we make a bottle. Uh, sometimes the rim sort of buckles as you as you draw it out. Uh, we use pretty medieval tools, by the way, and we use something called jacks or pucellas thin down and pull out a neck and uh, you have to have something to pull against and it's often uh, so you know again 
a normal glass maker might want these to be symmetrical, you yeah. know, a very symmetrical top or the bottle. I personally love them to be fluid. all fluid and folded up. Yes, I'm glad you used that word, because that, that really is the essence of glass, the yeah. fluidity of it. And I think that's reflected very much in, in your work. It's what I try to yeah. express, yes. Yeah. So I'd like to just kind of bring you back to, to running a studio. I mean, it's a huge commitment, isn't it? Mm. And, and how in this... It is. In this it's day, mad. It's mad. mad. In this day and age, I mean, are there still apprenticeships for, for glass blowers, or is that gone completely. I mean, no, no there are. I mean, you know, obviously there's a limit to how many people mm. can take on at any yeah. given time, but, um, you know, virtually virtually everybody who works here, not not everybody, but, yeah, virtually everybody who works here in my glass blowing team has, um, has kind of served a kind of apprenticeship. You know, they've come from college or not. You know, Bruce, the chap who you're filming, uh, who's working with me today, he, he started from scratch. He's South African and he had done a bit of lamp work, flame work, which is working with tubes over a kind of Bunsen burner. Um, and that was his experience when he, when he turned up and said, you know, will you teach me or can, can I join you? You know, I, okay, perhaps I needed somebody at that moment and, I, I, and he's He's now my workshop manager and he's... But it's people with a passion, isn't it, and an enthusiasm that really you're looking for. Absolutely. Um, one thing that interested me actually reading the book and, and going through the essays was the number of women, because I thought it was a very sort of physical thing that I was yeah, playing, but yeah. it's really encouraging to see that there's a real mix, isn't there? Of very much so, very much so. Uh, some of the world's greatest glass artists are women. Um, I, 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 could name a few, but perhaps that's irrelevant. But but you know, in in it, virtually every country, there are important women. I mean, some of some of in Iceland, the the most important class artists. Uh, 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 you know, wherever you look, yes. No, I I I think there is a lot of equality in that yeah. sense, in the in the glass world, and it's uh, it's it's surprisingly considering that tradition of secrecy, it's a very open um, uh, craft. People um, share information and, uh, and I've always thought of it as being a bit like having a huge family mm. you know, and, and that's how it is here. Yeah, uh, you know, hope I'm not too patriarchal and, uh, and that's how it is internationally too. You know, we have these symposia international symposia from time to time in the Czech Republic or some other place and um, uh, and what's been wonderful is how glass has transcended the political barriers mm -hmm. you know and tell me you know in, in years to come Peter how would you like to be remembered you know within your industry Mm. Or in your craft, because you, sure. you know, as I said earlier, you have elevated it to an art form. There is nothing here that wouldn't be out of place in a fine art gallery. Um, well, that's very nice of you to say that. Uh, how would I like to be remembered? Gosh, that's something I ought to be thinking about. Um, I mean, we 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 operate like a mini kibbutz you know we're, yeah. we're quite a democratic setup and I'd like you know it'd be nice to think that uh, if I retire or keel over in a while um, you know things will continue I mean but I, sadly I don't own this property we rent it you know for as long as they can keep it going or keep it together um, how would I like to be remembered? God, that's some that's a very awkward question. That's something I really should should give a lot of thought to. Anyway, you're... I'd like I you know, obviously I'd like to be thought of as having as you said, made a major yeah. contribution. And uh, ultimately one would like to think that uh, glass will be there is a hierarchy of media. Yeah. Sadly. And actually, craft is, you know, the fine artists often look down on, on the decorative art people. And that's, that's a great shame, particularly as 
more and more fine artists are using mm. craft skills, craft techniques to make their work or to have people act as technicians in their work. Um, and I'd like, I'd, like, I'd like to think that in years to come, I don't know how I'll be remembered, but I'd like glass to be accepted as a, as a, a medium. Uh, you know, I've all, I always think of it as a bit like a Cinderella medium. I guess, I mean, I, what I see now in the craft market is it's, it, people, there is definitely a surge back to people wanting to go and understand how these things are made and actually seeing the pleasure and enjoyment and, and getting the pleasure and enjoyment of something that is handmade. And I, I think you're right, glass has been a little bit of a Cinderella, but it's such a beautiful art form that, you know, we, sh we should be embracing it far more. And the only way I guess we can get that out is if we get, you know, bigger exhibitions by you know, major institutions that will, you know, make it acceptable in a way. I think, well, there are a couple of things, I mean, I could me mention. Mm. One is that um, there's a, an exhibition called SOFA that takes place annually in America. Uh, it's called, it stands for Sculptural Objects and Functional Art. And it is the world's best art craft show, yeah. without a doubt. Collect comes fairly close. Uh, it's a, it has a slightly different ambiance, a different feel. I mean, the American version is big, bold, mm. brash. Collect is cooler, calmer. Uh, but at SOFA, glass is the dominant medium. You know, it's, uh, in, a, in the States, people have the money and space and courage to mm. put it. At the British public, is still a little bit caught up in cut glass decanters. Uh, but it's changing, and yeah. we are helping to change that here mm -hmm. uh, in our studio. Um, the very fact that people can watch the pieces being made and see the, pr the products in our gallery, uh, it gives them a totally fresh view of what's involved and how much is involved and how much sweat is involved. I mean, maybe now that people, for example, I mean, Whitefriars glass, which is, you know, manufactured glass and impressed glass, people have, have taken an interest in that, and obviously it's suddenly become an auction. Very collect collectible. collectible. Then maybe that will be the next stage. Then people will look at studio glass and say, oh, yeah, this is, a, this is an art form. At the moment, it's very accessible, isn't it, in terms of price and in terms of quality? I, I think it's amazingly <laughs> yeah. accessible. Yeah. It's really relatively inexpensive compared for what goes into it, yeah. you know, compared with some canvas that's just da or you know thing that's dashed off a little gesture or thing, you know, four thousand pounds, you know, the the co I can't tell you, I don't want to go into it, what's involved in terms of cost and sweat and labour in each piece, but glass, you know, always has been thought of as being fragile and expendable. And people are a little bit scared of that, yeah. in a sense. But, but then, you know, some pieces have lasted thousands of years. I mean, literally, two or three thousand years. They're, the museums are full of them, come to think of it. Uh, so it isn't, you know, it, it, that's, it's not a thing to be scared of. And, I mean, you, you, sitting here talking to you, you enthuse about the subject. I mean, it's, you just want to go out and tell the world because it's just wonderful I can't ever see you retiring I think you'll be <laughs> uh, I suspect not no yeah. that's I mentioned we were yeah, flat hunting yeah, yeah. but that that's in order to be closer yeah, so yeah. I can just pop in and you know and I can gracefully or, or withdraw in a sort of dignified fashion you know and hope that I can continue to make a contribution I mean there are uh, you know, I was involved in the start of uh, an organisation called the Contemporary Glass mm. Society, uh, which, and I met, um, uh, there's this wonderful act uh, um, event, which you probably know about, called Art in Action, yeah. which took place last week, and, uh, or earlier this, uh, where are we? Last yeah, week, last yeah. week, that's right. And I, I was there, I gave a talk on the Thursday, first day, it's always a good day, you know. And, um, I met somebody, uh, an administrator from the, the Contemporary Glass Society, CGS, and she said, you know, we've now got 750 members. Well, nothing like your organisation, of course. 
but that's pretty good, you know, because uh, many of those, most of those people are practitioners. And uh, so I think glass is definitely uh, uh, coming. Good. If it hasn't already got here, it's on its way. You know, and I'm I'm very proud. I'm very pleased and proud to be part of that um, evolution. Sure. Yeah. Peter Layton, thank you. You're welcome. Mm. That, that all was, right. That was perfect, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah.